Hello and welcome to the podcast that sets out to answer that age-old primary school playground question of what's your top five? And today I'm thrilled to be joined by a writer, an actor, a comedian and the man behind probably the most iconic Scottish comedian character of the last 20 years, Sanjeev Colley. How are you? Uh, be, truth be told, a little bit disappointed. Because I want to be doing episode six so I could pick my top five of the podcast. <laughs> of the done. guests. So I can't really pick your previous three, can I? It doesn't qualify. Well, I'll, I'll just cut it and I'll release this as episode six. And okay. Get... <laughs> my favourite was Grado. <laughs> no. Um, no, I'm very pleased to be here. No, delighted to have you. Yeah. Delighted to um, have you. And the, and the stuff you were asking me is kind of, it's that stuff that I think about all the time anyway, yeah. do you know what I mean? To be fair, I was pretty surprised when I kind of reached out to see if you wanted to do it and it was a kind of straight up yes. Well, I, I can like, leave now if you want. I mean, No, no, I, no, 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 no. Anyway, you're here now, the door's locked. If, I dis if I've disappointed you with my humility. Absolutely. Would not. you want that was mere arrogance? The, the door is locked, you're going nowhere. <laughs> so this is a hostage situation? This is, a, this is it. Okay. Hostages are notably talkable, so you'll be all right. It's got Stockholm Syndrome. I'll end up getting engaged to you or something. <laughs> I look forward to that. Okay, but then if I get engaged, you get married, then the chat stops. I know, but I seek wedding. That's Seek a, wedding, have you been? What a party. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. So I, I was chatting about this. I was doing a Q&A about Still Game the other night, and um, I was saying how I sort of based Navid and my dad, right? And in my mind, I, it was 20 years ago when Still Game started. It, in my head, I think I'd wanted to play Navid like my dad, a turban Sikh man, right? Yeah. But we couldn't because nay drink at a Muslim wedding. Because as you know, a Sikh wedding is like an effing a brewery. To drink. It's a bottle of Bacardi, a bottle of God, bottle, vodka, a bottle of... Shivish Regals. <laughs> Peach Snaps for some reason yeah. at every table. Yeah. And like beer on tap and no evening guests. Like when we got, so my, me and my wife got married like in 2000. Yeah. Um, so basically my dad was paying for it. And um, so my wife said to my dad, um, so what, what are we doing for evening guests? And he genuinely said, what is evening guest? <laughs> and I explained to him that it's someone you don't like and they get a rolling sausage. And he said, no, everyone that comes to my son's wedding will be fed and watered. <laughs> And Beard and Cinzano and Bacardi and Archer. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's a revelation to a lot of um, non Sikhs when they go to Sikh weddings. It's the thing that's become now is the money guns. They press it and it like shoots the money now, up in the air. Okay, so you're but, more up on this than I am because I've not been. My nephew, hopefully, two of my nephews are going to get married in the next couple of years, but it's been a while since I've done a Sikh wedding. Uh, so, is this like the, the firing the t shirts, the, yeah, the they, merch? Yeah, they do. They fire the merch oh. out and then they've got like the money gun. You load it up and it like sprays. The cash. A money gun is such a Punjabi thing. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like loud and it's money and it's flashy. Uh, yeah. Oh, and it, there's no subtlety. We're, that, that's been Punjab culture all over. Uh, money gun. So who fires it? The well, just kind of people I think at the wedding too. So they to fire it at the groom and the bride. Yeah, so and it's, it's like, like, the the dance, so it's like on the dance floor and how and like throw money up in the dance floor. But now they don't need to throw it. They're just well, like, what it used to be back in the day was so we do the bunga dance and they'd be dancing and you had to sort of it wasn't written down anywhere, but you had to twirl cash around their head and then put it on a designated table and i don't know if everyone's aware of this but the scotland had a pound note longer than england so we would get requests from Sikh families down it's south to like they'd send us like 50 quid notes and we'd to send them 100 one, 101 pound notes, notes so they could have lower denomination notes so they could do the weddings that's it just because you said that my uh, we lived in england for when i was really young um whereabouts Sudbury in Suffolk, so Sud not far from like one, but it's in Edmonds. Ah, so the home, home county sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, so my dad used to like play at a football club and he would go up to the bar and he would hand over a pound note, but yeah. they would just assume it was a fiver. So he would oh. then put it in the towel. He would eventually obviously tell them, but he would go up. Would he though? Well, he says he would. Because we're, we're, <laughs> no, we're supposed to be breaking the stereotypes down, so yeah, exactly. not, not enhancing them. Yeah, but he would go and get, I don't know how much a pint was yeah. back then. But, uh, well, do you know the band The Stranglers? What? The band, the band, the Stranglers. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. They were originally they were from they were an eight piece from uh, Ipswich called the Suffolk Eight. Now people at home will get that eventually, <laughs> uh, but you haven't. No, Suffolk Eight Strangler. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> see what, do you know what happens when you dissect a frog? It dies. <laughs> no, do you know what? It's funny because you've explained that now. Is I it? Oh, got well, it. An annotated joke there. <laughs> Maths, it's science. <laughs> Apologies. So you you spent some time in Suffolk then. <sighs> I didn't want to admit it, but I was born there. Like yourself, I was born there. Well, well, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's just that way. The thing is, you can't tell from your voice, but you can tell from my voice because there's certain things I see like word and bird, and well, it should be word and bird. Well, it's I think the only word that I said it was uh, garage is the like garage, garage. garage. Like that yeah. was the only. So, do you say Nigel Farage or prick? 
something worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say there's something yeah. worse. Yeah. Um, no, but you you kind of briefly touched on there when you said maths and English. Um, obviously, this is based on the playground question of what's your top yes. five yes, 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 uh, yes. when you were at school. Uh, would I be right in saying that your primary school experience in secondary school was probably very different uh, to those of maybe a Sikh culture now? Oh, uh, totally, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. St. Aloysius. It was. It was. It went... I mean, originally, so, so I grew up in... Um, in Bishop Briggs, North Glasgow. Now, here's the thing about Glasgow, right? So, where do you stay? South side. Okay. Yeah. There you, are. you said it, south side. Yeah. Okay. Glasgow has a south side, yeah. a west end, yeah. an east end, and a north. Nothing. There's no word. <laughs> the the north. north of Glasgow is <laughs> yeah. not considered interesting enough to garner a noun. <laughs> there's no north end or north side, just yeah. the north, like I... Game of Thrones. <laughs> like there's White Fine Walkers and Lindsay, yeah. do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, I grew up in North Glasgow. It's kind of Spam Valley, aspirational Bishop Briggs sort of thing. Yeah. And um, I went to the local primary school, Meadowburn Primary, just near where, I think it's an Asda now, it used to be a fine fair for all the pensioners out there. <laughs> and, and so I was there for primaries one, two, and three. And then my mum and dad decided to send me to fee paying Catholic school, St. Aloysius, yep. which was in the south side of Glasgow at the time. So suddenly I've, I've got a green uniform and getting two buses to school and I, I don't quite know why. Yeah. And I'm walking back through the guys that you went, I went to school with and they're rubbering me. Yep because they clearly think that I think I'm too good for them. I'm like, mate, I, this was not my decision. It wasn't your choice. I want to be hanging out with you, Gordon, and you, David, uh, but I'm hanging out with with, um, Rory with, and... with, with Catholics <laughs> in the <this. laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No. <laughs> um, but uh, I, so um, private school education, I used to go to mass every week. I went to extra mass during Easter just to fit in. Yeah. Um, I probably know more about the Catholic religion than I do about the Sikh religion. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm lapsed from every single religion, but just in terms of what I remember. Because yeah. there's so much pomp and ceremony with, with, with Catholicism. There's the, the great dance routines, great hats. I mean, you know, <laughs> apart from the child abuse, it's actually co really, really good lifestyle. Um, and, the, and the abstinence, you know, I couldn't, couldn't hack that. Um, and also uh, 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 a form of contraception called the rhythm method, which is, <laughs> just, just does not work. So, uh, yeah, no, pretty different, pretty kind of um, middle class and kind of sheltered. So it's a weird thing because... I grew up in Bishop Briggs, which is very vanilla, pretty, pretty white neighborhood. Yeah. And I'm going to Catholic school, um, which again, I mean, me, my brother, and one other guy were the three non-Catholics in the place, certainly the, the three only non-white people in the place. Yeah. Um, but I weirdly don't, I didn't suffer a huge amount of racism because there's a lot of second and third generation uh, Irish and Italian families. Of course. And I think everyone felt to some degree like they were immigrants. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And, yeah, you know, yeah. sadly, you know, Anyone of a Catholic Irish descent in Glasgow still gets prejudice, you know. Yeah, because a lot of them will as well, the, let's say the Irish and Italian, their parents will probably, although they'll be in good jobs and can afford to send them, they'll have worked their yes. way to those totally. good jobs. Totally. I mean, I've always said if you if you want to see the sort of the British Asian or Scottish Asian experience in a kind of, in a sort of like a single frame, go to a private school at pick-up time and there'll be at least two or three shop vans. So, I mean, that, that tells <laughs> the so story, true. doesn't it? Yeah. And it's probably going to also be like an Italian restaurant van <laughs> yeah. because they're working those stereotypical jobs to get the kids uh, the and education they never had. And then work in their family how business many times, after. How many times have you been to a Chinese carryout and the 16-year-old is doing their physics homework at exactly. the table <laughs> as they're serving it? I mean, it's I, I love seeing that stuff because yeah. it's... it's it, it's so aspirational that that was that was the thing about how I grew up. My mum and my mum and dad were really were educated, and my, my dad trained as a teacher. My mum trained as a social worker, and they just wanted us to have the best education. Life, yeah. um, and we did, you know. I mean, I even though I followed a very different path to the one that I thought I was going to, or maybe yeah. the one they thought I should have. Yeah. Um, it was the education I got at school that to give you that platform. No, completely, completely. Yeah. So, let's say top fives. Can you? narrow down to your top five subjects at school okay the one i was probably i, I was an annoying all-rounder um i mean i had no pals and i smelled of crisps but academically <laughs> i was the boy um we used to have this joke that i could never be a beekeeper because I, I didn't know what a bee looked like i was, I was all, all a's all the time from a young age yeah. um in fact i remember being in primary one or two at school and being whisked to the head mistress's office and i thought i was in trouble and what had happened was that for some reason they'd asked me to spell the word physics and I got it correct. So I, got, I thought, how, how badly have I spelled that word that they're this taking me to the headmistress? So of course I totally misspelled it when I got there. Yeah. But seemingly I was that guy, you know. 
um, always quite precocious, and I could have probably spelled pre precocious <laughs> in primary one. So um, math, but, but maths was the one that I liked the most and possibly was best at, but I was really good at English. Now, I didn't like the English that we were given, mm -hmm. but I liked things like figures of speech and, and like things like alliteration and sarcasm, like totes, all that stuff. I, I enjoyed that. And the, a lot of that comes from Latin. I was very good at Latin. Right. And actually, I think doing Latin really, really helped my English and actually still helps. You know, things, things that you, you pick up from the way that Latin is constructed. So, I, and I, I actually enjoyed Latin. Actually, just the, the linguistics and language part more than the kind of cultural bit. Because the thing is that the Roman Empire and, and all of that is actually really, really interesting. But for some reason, it kind of left me a wee bit cold. Um, maybe it's because uh, as a Scottish Indian, I was bored of empires. <laughs> you know, the, the, the jackboot on my throat. So I don't need another one, <laughs> but Christ. Um, so maths, English, Latin. I really like biology. Yeah. Yeah, I liked the, how, the, how the body worked. And it's probably why I thought I wanted to be a doctor, because um, I really enjoyed how the lungs work, how the heart's, heart works, you know kind of physiology and anatomy. And um, I hated history, dropped that as soon as I could. Um, wasn't mad keen in geography. Um, what does that leave then? Um, um, what would be my fifth one? Probably, well, I did Greek, actually. Yeah. yeah, I did Greek. I did, I did, See, I did all, classical Greek. When I was at school, it was just French and Spanish. Yeah, that's it. Like, um, oh no, French. Oh. I love French. I did. I was really good at it. I wasn't great at speaking it because I was really, really shy. Right. And you have to. The speaking. Oh, yeah. Come on, I can do it now, but I back know, then. Like, come on, have a deal. Je m'appelle. Je m'appelle. Don la planche. Um, <laughs> sounds and cool. Yeah, sounds are cool. So I, when I was like, when, when I remember, I used to get like top marks when it was something that was sort of like grammatical, but mm -hmm. spoken French, I, I just lacked the confidence there. But I remember though, this genuinely happened. I was interrailing when I was 20 and I was on my own. I was meant to go with a pal, but his, his father passed away and I wasn't going to go, but then I got dumped and I had to leave Glasgow because everywhere I looked, memories of my girlfriend. <laughs> so I thought, do you know what? I'm going to go interrailing on my own. And um, I ended up in the south of France and uh, it was I was, it was kind of the last leg of my holiday and I, maybe I had probably a week theoretically left and I was in Nice. I arrived at Nice, right? And uh, I been I was on my own, so I was staying in youth hostels. That was the cheapest way of doing it. So it's staying in dorms. So I rocks up at Nice and and really nice couple that ran it. But there was there were there were signs everywhere saying, "Please put your stuff in the lockers. There have been thefts." I thought, well, "I'm not putting it in the lockers because that's they'll go straight to the lockers." So what I'll do is I'll put all the important stuff in my bum bag, and I'll sleep with a bum bag on, like you know, round the back sort of thing, <laughs> and um, you know, near the arse crack. You know, so <laughs> who's going to go near that? Um, so I put in my interrail ticket, my remaining cash and my passport and that goes in the bum bag and I sleep and I wake up and it's gone and I have no idea how they got it off me. No, I didn't wake up. I'm a heavy sleeper. Uh -huh. All the important stuff gone because if I just had the cash, I would have just bought a train ticket and gone to Amsterdam where I had family yeah. and, a, and, and somewhere to stay. I could sort of stuff out. If I just had the passport, I would have just jumped on trains and if they asked my ticket, I'd say British citizen and the worst that they would do is chuck me off the train. Yeah. And if I just had my interrail ticket, then obviously I could just get the train. Because I found that out pretty pretty quickly that without a passport, you are nothing. And uh, any long story short, I'd, I, I sort of lived on a baguette for three days <laughs> as my dad tried to wire me cash through to the Barclay Banks in Nice, and it wasn't happening. Yeah. And uh, so I had no cash. So I was jumping on and off buses. And it's dead easy to do that in France and Italy because there's this weird system where it's kind of self-policing. You just stamp your own ticket. So I thought, well, I can justify morally doing jumping on. on I don't have any money, so I'll, I'll just do it. And then I got caught because um, I'd been. St I, I'd, I'd actually got the bus into Central Nice, sat at the Barclays Bank all day. The fucking money didn't come through, so then I had to get back to the hotel, and then I jumped on the bus. And then these two cops come on, and I was like, I got nothing. <laughs> so they, they they took me off the bus. And the thing was, I looked like a vagrant. You know, I hadn't shaved. I had a ponytail. Try not to be physically sick, but it was 1991 <laughs> in my defense. And um, they just took one look at me, and one of them was saying, you know, I would throw him in jail. And then I, I went really French. I went, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire? <laughs> On a volé ma passeport. On a volé tout l'argent, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire? Uh. And they were like, all right, well, tell you what, in French, you know, they said, you know, um, what to do is when you get back to Glasgow, then please could you send us uh, 50 francs, because it was still francs then. Uh, which I did, but yeah. So uh, I suddenly went really kind of Jean Pierre, Jean Pierre, <laughs> um, and like, oh, where did that come from? Cause I, I couldn't do that when I was fourteen, but 
six years later that I was given it the full French. If you were ever in Rome and you got pulled over, Latin. But <laughs> oh, bring it, bring in the old Roman. No, yeah, yeah. yeah the if you're ever on a bus in Italy, yeah, so we're going to jail, we're gonna give you, we're going to give you a lectureship. <laughs> <laughs> so that actually leads nicely on to one of the next uh, top five. See, so you went into railing. Right. Um, top five places you've visited now i can assume you've probably visited quite a lot of places um i didn't not as many as i'd like um no. actually no no because i got married um uh when i was uh 30 and and fiona bless her heart we went we, we, on we went on a honeymoon to thailand and we flew the long story short we, we have cousins or travel agents and their kind of wedding gift to us was flights to thailand on china airlines it was the worst flight of our lives and ever since then Fiona, it's really hard for Fiona to fly. We managed to do short haul. Yeah. So we've done, especially with the kids as well, because yeah. they're not going to de deny them. But she hates flying, but we've done, you know, France a few times, Holland, Italy. I always wanted to go to Australia, Vietnam, all those places. Um, maybe one day, you know, if, if you know, I'll, I'll give her like a horse to Mazapam and <laughs> wake up in Sydney. But Carrying her between yeah, transfer flights. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like weekend at Bernie's. Um, but I'd... Um, so, so there are lots of places that I, I've, like Machu Picchu and all these places I'd, I'd love to go, Cambodia. But, I mean, I, I've traveled enough. So, I mean, Italy. I mean, Florence is a place that I went to when I was interrailing. Firenze, um, if I was caught by the cops. Um, <laughs> and uh, what an amazing, amazing city. The thing is, when I was there, I was staying in a youth hostel. And at youth hostels, they kick you out at nine in the morning. And so you're wandering about like in the blazing, like, you know, mid-morning sun. Yeah. Whereas that's when you should be in your bed. And then you go out later when it's like four o'clock. And it's so cool um, day, I, would, yeah. I would love to take Fiona and the kids back now. And we've tried to, we, we tried to actually a few times to go to Tuscany on holiday. So sort of a beachy thing for the kids, but then we day trip to Florence. But we managed to go to Lake uh, Garda and do a day trip to Venice. And Venice, as overrun and smelly and all that as it is, I mean, everywhere you look is like a Renaissance painting. Yeah. And, you know, I am I am your tight dad. I mean, I get that from my tight dad. <laughs> and the, the, the gondola ride. And I was like, how much? But I said, you know what? How can you not go on a gondola ride in Venice? And who are we kidding? We're not travelers. We're tourists. Yeah. So I, I, I said goodbye to 100 euros because it was 100 euros. And it was actually up there with the best 100 euros ever spent. Ben, it was yeah. amazing wow. being on a gondola in Venice, as cliched as that sounds. Was no, absolutely. It's my, my mate uh, for their honeymoon, they just, I think it was like three weeks, and they just started at the north of Italy and worked their way down. And unfortunately for them, it was kind of where COVID was, wasn't in, well, it was some things were open, some, so they would get to a city and half of it would be open, but they'd turn yeah. up and other things were closed. But that's one thing they said about places like Florence and Venice. It didn't actually affect them too much because just being outside you're just yeah. looking at it and it's just beautiful so yeah, i think yeah, yeah, were, yeah, yeah. you like that so we've got uh, italy as a whole for i'd say so florence yeah. especially and there's still bits in florence you know i'd love to go to capri or to calabria or sicily yeah um would love to go to um so there um barcelona is what a place i've been to yeah. two or three times uh i mean the best way to describe it is and the way i got this perspective was the last time we went to barcelona was we did we did a couple of cruises and I wasn't sure about cruising because I like the idea of going to different cities and, you know, but it's the same thing as staying in youth hostels. When you get to the city, say you get to Malaga or wherever it happens to be, you're getting there quite early and you're leaving quite early. And my favorite time to be in a city is in the early evening after the siesta when it's cooler and people are just a bit more relaxed. So, um, but what we did, we, we did, um, we did the Caribbean cruise, the Royal Caribbean, and it was the Mediterranean I think there's loads yeah. of great cities. Yeah. Cannes, uh, Malaga was one of them. I think Valencia um, and Barcelona was, and, I, and I'd been to Barcelona myself, right? But going with um, with the family and we thought, do you know what? We've only got a few hours in Barcelona. Let's actually do the open top bus. Yeah. And you know when you're cutting about Glasgow and you see the tourists in the open top bus and you think, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Barcelona, yeah. I think, no, no, I, the thing is it, Actually, I bet you if I did the open top bus in Glasgow, I'd bloody love it. It would be it. great and it'd be things you've never seen before. Cause I'd go to the Necropolis or something, which I've, which I've heard talk about but I've never been to. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. you're right. It's like, that was, Glasgow, it's one of those you look up, it's actually, oh, I've never yeah. noticed yeah. that, but with Barcelona, we did the open top bus as well and it was one of those, kind of don't tend to do them. 
it was well worth it. Oh, it was, it really was well worth it. Because so the thing good. is, is that you, you you'll know that you'll know this, and you, you go to the Sagrada Familia, but you don't queue up. You just you're just there. You're just there, and you see it, and you could jump off and jump back on. Yeah. But when you got limited time, you're like, okay, right, we've done that. We're not going to queue because that probably would be a waste of time anyway. Yeah. And then, and it's, it's amazing. It's a feast for the eyes. Then you jump back on. But the sense I got of Barcelona from doing it that way was, it was almost like Barcelona had been designed by five different architects. They're like each given a zone. <laughs> but you do that, you do that, you do that. So Gaudi, you do that bit. And uh, then you go to the Olympic Village bit, which is like very different vibe, but so beautiful and clean. Modernist. Yeah. But just the architecture. I mean, they just know what they're doing, don't they? You, know, you look everywhere, you see you see something that's Gaudi-esque or Dali-esque. Just, they're just like... I'm not actually that big in visual art, but I do, and, and I don't know a huge amount of architecture, but I know what I like, and everywhere you looked in Barcelona, so many different styles, but all brilliant. Yeah, because we just went through, I was, I think it was maybe 13, 14, we were staying in like Calella de Mar or something like an hour on the train. Anyway. Right. So we did the So just along the coast, like yeah, kinda, and we just between Sitges and Barcelona maybe? Yeah, or, right. just kind of, and we did yeah. a day trip up, um, and it was me and my brother were want to go to the new camp like that's what we, well, we did that do. as well we did and that it was well. that way like i've got a younger sister and like my mom they were about like mm. okay and even they were like wow like, you go in the tunnel and it's got like the yeah. chapel and then you walk out and it's just the architecture for a football stadium yes well it's just a big bowl but it's not it does so much yeah. more to it it's something special yeah, i've done the new camp twice yeah, actually I did, but, but not as for a match but i'd love to do that but just the tour i took well, my boy Vinny twice if you're in the way section of a you are so far up the back. Yeah. It's a couple, I've never been for a match, but my mates have all like sent photos and stuff. You yeah. are up in the nosebleeds yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. for the new camp. But no, it's a bus. Well, they don't like tourists. There's a lot. <laughs> they don't want us to go back. Uh, but it's one of those cities I think everyone right. needs to visit. It's and the a, food. Oh. You know what I mean, I love tapas. I love the notion of tapas. Yeah. I love the, the whole small plates thing is right up my street. Pretty much if chorizos and anything, <sighs> I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> or they, you know, they, we had it for the first time. It might not have been Barcelona, but it was on that trip. All they do is like little triangles of manchego cheese and almonds oh. and rock salt. So simple, so good. And just prawns, just the best prawns. Oh, oh. I'm starving. <laughs> I know. So yeah, Barcelona ticks pretty much all the boxes. Because yeah. you think to yourself, it's such a culturally beautiful city. Oh, and by the way, the best football in the world. <laughs> yeah. How, how dare you? <laughs> Stick to your lane, Barcelona. Do one thing really well, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's not loads of different things, really. Yeah, really. yeah. So moving away from Europe, is there other... Well, um, uh, I went round, touring around America um, when, I, uh, when I was uh, 23 years old. I went with my pal, Arif, who was the one that I was meant to entrail with right. three years previously. So we did that thing. We got the four-week pass on was it Delta airlines and it's a standby thing so you can just jump on and off planes yes. like buses for four weeks so we had all the places we want to hit yeah so i really wanted to go to memphis because i wanted to go to graceland yep. but i also wanted to see al green preaching and i'd managed it which was amazing i mean memphis is a horrible place yeah it's still i mean well then i mean probably still is segregated pretty yeah. much and maybe not officially segregated yeah they'll but, pretend or not but <laughs> yeah yeah well the the bit where al green's chapel was was a place called the, the hale methodist church and you get the bus there and you know already that it's just dirt poor yeah and the only phone in the place was in the the chicken shop i mean that was not even a cliche so um and uh i mean that's a story for another podcast but i actually did <laughs> get to see al green preaching and he offered us a lift to the airport and i said no because i booked a taxi <laughs> shoot me um i also the other thing i wanted to do was go to minneapolis because I'm a, I'm a total prince obsessive right and I, we did we drove to paisley park and um, we didn't meet prince but we met some of the new power generation another story for another podcast um but the uh i, I remember thinking that the, the 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 three places in north america that that i went to that i thought i could live here one was vancouver one was san francisco but the one probably that trumped them was chicago that's, I love Chicago. Chicago is right up there. Um, see the whole just East Coast, like around that bit, like Philadelphia, Boston. Mm. You know, I've never, I've been to Florida like once, but Aye. that's where I want to go. I mean, by the half of engaged, we've talked about like where we'd go for honeymoons and I would love to just travel like America, like that's yeah. around that area. I'm obsessed with what you say. I would love to go down to like Memphis and yeah. like a bit down to south, go to the Grand Old Opry and yeah, all that yeah, kind yeah. You've of got stuff. New Orleans. Yeah. On July the fourth, it's the seventh circle of hell. <laughs> it's just honestly there's naked wrestling 
and Jello and stuff. It's what date was that? No. <laughs> Independence Day. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. So like the the East Coast, like of America, for me is right. Yeah, New right York is amazing, and New York is a, 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 I can't you can't tire of it, and also it's much safer now. Yeah. I mean, I would never have gone in the sort of late seventies, early eighties. You know, you just have to watch like taxi driver like, nah, I'm not going there. <laughs> um, but then you go now, and it's just such so much more gentrified. You could even just go to Brooklyn, yeah, and there'd be enough to do and see. And also, could, if anyone ever goes to New York, right? There's a thing now. What's it called? It, it's a disused train line, and is it called the the Green Line or the? I can't remember what it's called, but they were going to demolish it, but there was a big petition to save it because it was kind of like a a landmark, and then. It's now a walkway, and they've got like they, they they put like shrubbery and plants along it, and and it's a really nice thing to do to walk along it. But the best ice lollies I've had in my entire life, in my fifty one years on this planet, you get on the Green Line, and I've had, never had them anywhere else. They were just these little stalls kind of dotted along, and oh, I can't tell you these ice lollies. They were they were like they had like I think kiwi fruit, pineapple, the bits of the fruit in the ice lolly, oh. and then frozen in it. I've tried to recreate this, and I can't. <laughs> So and go to Barcelona for your mains and go to New York for your dessert. Is yeah, if you, can, if you you know, if you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a package you could yeah. do the starter mean and pud package on Virgin. Um, but New York, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's just it's all there, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely buzzing. I mean, Times Square. Although someone was saying to me, Times Square has got really violent recently. Uh, yeah, a lot of people say it's like it's, it's on TikTok. You see people kind of seeing Times Square for the first time, and they're like, "No thanks," because mm. it's just intense just mm. cramp like it's the amount of people in such a small place because it's yeah. so busy people are living and working and like, yeah so it's all mixed in kind of london but hyped up a, no totally a totally more. yeah I remember we we went we hired bikes in central park and then we just happened to come out at a certain exit and there was trump tower right there and um uh and it was funny because like the, the the wall of security around it you know, <laughs> was you know um and then he loves he walked, a wall. Yeah. He, he does love a wall, doesn't he? Made of Mexicans. Uh, and then we walked another wee bit and it was, we're in Chelsea and we're this amazing um, food hall in Chelsea. Um, so yeah, it's all, that's the thing. It's surprisingly walkable. You think, it, but Manhattan's quite compact. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll try and so group kind of North America. We've got some beautiful places yeah. in, uh, in Europe. Anything kind of Asia way that you've been? Well, there? I mean, so my folks are from India. Actually, my dad grew up in India. My mum grew up in Kenya, in Nairobi, which is a massive Sikh community because the British brought a lot of Indians over to build the railway in East Africa. So there's huge Indian communities in like places like Kenya, Mombasa. And my mum grew up in Nairobi, but my dad grew up in North India. So I've been to, for two really big, big family holidays. Yeah. Um, and I, see when you're 12, right, you don't appreciate the ancient cultures of India, you just appreciate that there's no fucking toilets. I mean, that's basically <laughs> your, your main issue when you're 12. Yeah. And apparently, no, I, I think I was younger at that point because there, there were three big family holidays. I went when I was five and went when I was eight and then 11. And I think the middle holiday, I was like little Lord Fauntleroy. So <laughs> we were staying in, um, so my dad's Bind, which is a village, is a place called Ferozpur, which is in the Punjab, quite near the border with Pakistan. And so my dad's brother still ran the family farm there, and it's a proper working farm. So no toilets. And you basically shat into a hole in the ground, right? Yeah. So me, we Glasgow guy like that, pushing his glasses up, saying, nope, not doing it. Um, I would rather go constipated for three weeks. <laughs> so bless him, my dad's brother had to make a, like a six-hour round trip on a scooter to buy this wooden commode that just sat on the hole in the ground. Yeah. I mean, still shitting in the hole in the ground, but, but on, a, on a wooden throne. Absolutely. So that was me when I was eight and twelve. So I didn't really, really appreciate it. But we, part of that holiday meant going to Malaysia as well, because my dad's sister, who funnily enough is now in Glasgow visiting my dad's other sister. Anyway, she, she grew up in she, she got married and and brought up her kids in Malaysia. So we went to Malaysia, and that's an amazing place. I haven't really been back since, but we did go to Singapore, and that is like New York in the sense that. So much going on in yeah. such a small space. My 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 mates, uh, Mrs. worked out there for six months. Yeah, and funny enough, she worked at six months in New York. Oh, she really? had a year. It was like six months in New York, then six months in Singapore. And he went out to see her for a month or so, and he said it's just like nothing you've ever seen before. Like it, it's just, it's like something from a film. Oh no, the it way is. it's ramped up. It, and he it, went to yeah. the Grand Prix and all that was that was there. And it said they had like a music festival at the Grand Prix. He says everything was just. 
turned up, that right. ramped up that notch yeah. more. Pretty special like, yeah. place. I, I mean, think. I wish I could. I was 12 when I was there, so I probably didn't appreciate it. But the plumbing's excellent, by the way. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Um, you know, cause obviously, like, police at Singapore and Japan, you know, toilets talk to you and make you dinner. Um, I blow cold air on your bum bum. <laughs> But I, I just remember walking a, along the street and then 30 school kids come from somewhere and go to somewhere. I'm like, where did you come from and where are you going, Cotton Eye Joe? Like, <laughs> are you, have you come out of a manhole cover? Because I, I honestly <laughs> don't know where you come from because there are enough people here. And I just added 40 people to the equation. How is this small island supporting so many people yeah. so efficiently? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, very, they're very Nazi about litter and stuff, though. I mm -hmm. mean, it's proper massive fines for even like chewing gum and stuff. But it's kind of early, like it's been like that way for so long now, like cleanliness and everything. So it's yeah. just, it's just nature. Now. It's just it's cultural. Like, now. So closer to home, because you gave me some amazing places you visited. But I think we can both agree that there's nowhere like Glasgow. Do you no, <laughs> no, no, Glasgow um, is unique. So you were born there, in London. I was born you in born, London, Middlesex yeah. Hospital, um, and so my, so this longer story is my mum and dad got married um, in '66. 65, they got married. Was it an arranged marriage? Yes. Uh, lunch was at 12, dancing was at 3. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and then they came over to uh, the UK in 66. My mum was pregnant with my eldest brother. So he, my middle brother and myself, were all born in London. In, I was born in 1970. And, my, and then we moved around sort of West London, various kind of wee flats and houses and whatnot. Yeah. And then my dad... This, he, so he'd been a customs officer in Delhi and he was doing various jobs in London, but he decided to retrain as a teacher and he got a place in Dundee training uh, at college. But I think it was part of the university, but it was like a specific right. teacher training thing. So he would actually, um, he would he would go up to Dundee uh, on a Sunday evening and come back on a Friday night sort of yeah. thing. And he used to take, I said, where, where do you live, dad? He, he used to live in, 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 a, dist in, a, in, in a suburb of Dundee called Blackness. And I thought, you live in a place called Blackness. It feels like where Darth Vader would live, doesn't yeah. it? And the weird thing is, is that my daughter now is at Dundee Uni and she had a flat in the Blackness Road. Ah, oh, it's full circle. So full, totally full circle. <laughs> but I'm like, Dad, don't go to Blackness. It's, that's, it doesn't sound nice. Yeah. So then he got his first job in Glasgow and then that's when we all moved up. So when I was, I think, four, three, 73 it was, we all moved up. So... So basically, I've been in Glasgow since 1973. So for 48 of my 51 years, I've been in Glasgow. So I've I've not really known anything else. So yeah. and I do love that it's my hometown. I love yeah, Glasgow. Because I say I was born. It was my my brother, big brother. He was born in Glasgow. My dad's job took him down, and they were, were in British Endings because he was like a worked in London, but it was a lot cheaper to live in Sudbury and drive that one hour um, down. But I think I was maybe like three or four. If not even for before when we moved up. So I don't really, really remember it uh, at all, but it's kind of similar. My dad then got a job back in Glasgow mm. and he would leave on a Sunday and he'd come back down the Thursday, yeah. Thursday night. Was oh, that right? Yeah. yeah. But he just like lived with my gran and my papa, like just <laughs> yeah. uh, lived with them. But then eventually we all Aye. traipsed back up the road. But since you've where, been- where, where, where were your gran and your papa? Where were they? They were in the south side in King's Where's, Park. So, oh, King's Park? Yeah. Oh, right. So okay, yeah, yeah. They, he was, it was my mum's uh, mum and dad and my dad, Bumped in with them, yeah. Sunday night through to. So is that, like, is that sort of like roaring distance from Hamden then? Yeah. Yeah, pretty. Aye. That's yeah. where we. I've never know. I've. I lived in London for a few years after university, but I've never not had a G forty four postcode. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Ah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've lived in different areas of the south, but it's always been G forty four. So Mount Florida, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Sims Hill, uh -huh. Cathcart, Muir End. Muir right? End. Yeah. I used to work in the south side of Shoka. I, oh no, that's Newlands. That's not Muir. No, no. No, no. It's no, 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 it's because I'm across be the road from it. Because the cinema, there used to be cinema there, which is now flats. The cinema was the best cinema mm. ever. It was so yeah, good. Yeah, it was a lovely like Art two, Deco but, cinema, Yeah, it was, it? it's now flats. Yeah, I live across the road from there. That's they, they've I'm. kept the facade, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. So they knocked like the back of it down and then kept uh, the front. So that's still there. Well, in 1991, I used to work part-time in the south side of the showcase. Oh, uh, did you? Yes. I guess that was, that was a great, great take. We went there for my 30th birthday. You're it's joking. Like, yeah, because yeah. I was upset. We all lived and yeah. grew up around there. So yeah, uh, basically, there's kind of spoiled for good yeah. oh, Indian restaurants oh no, yeah. take away, like, in Glasgow. It's I mean, in, in as much, I, I laugh about the West End versus South Side thing, right? <laughs> and this this happened once, actually. I was, um, so I was staying in Hindland, as I, as I do now, and this was, I just got my flat, I was like late 20s, and uh, I was meeting pals who lived in 
I'd say Cross Hill, kind of Govan Hill. Yeah. So do you remember there's a place called the Meet and Eat on Allison Street? Sounds like a Dr. Seuss rhyme, but it's, actually, it's, it's an I actual to, cafe. I went to, I went to Horrid, so I, I you know that Horrid, area. Did yeah. you? So oh. I know that like, area, but I don't recognise. I was just listening to a podcast Jim Kerr did. He went to Hollywood. Yeah, Peter Mullen went to Hollywood. Yeah. Yes. There's some, there's some biggies. Frankie, Frankie Boyle. went to Hollywood. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I just please find the off switch if you possibly can. <laughs> um, so, um, so I was meeting pals in this place in Allison Street. So we're having this kind of Sunday fry up thing. And a couple of their pals came in by chance and they sat with us. And uh, the guy said to me, um, oh, so are you, are you from around here? I said, well, I'm from Hindland. And he went, oh, I. I said, what, West End is it? I said, yeah. He says, aye, West End. I said, what? He says, well, you know, people stay in the West End, don't they? But they live in the South <laughs> That is brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that I don't is know what so that good. Means. So I, I, I laugh about all that stuff. But having said that, though, I could still make more of an effort to go to like the Bungo or whatever. Yeah. Because there are so many good places, the, aren't there? The pubs and restaurants and all that yeah. on the South Side are like, they're great, but my other half's from Paisley. Mm -hmm. And I always joked like, oh, once you're on the South Side, you, you'll never get out. Yes. And now we're engaged and have a baby. And we're living in G44. And she's uh, like, oh, you were right. <laughs> like, I was like, everyone knows everyone. And once you're in, because uh, all my mates, there's like 14 of us from school and we all have our own flats over there houses and we're all within like a two mile radius yeah. we all live apart from one who has moved to Heinland. is that right is that right <laughs> but he even said that he's like i must have said <laughs> well, well, that bit I've, I've always been very fond because because we used to have a shop so so um st aloysius the primary school used to be in battlefield all right it used to be mansion house road so oh, up from langside road yeah, yeah, yeah so it's now the uppie flats if you can still call them that but it used to be up that way so um, because our school was there, uh, mum and dad got a shop. Because we're Asian, we have to get shops on the small print. <laughs> Sinclair Drive in Battlefield. Yeah. So I, I love Battlefield. I've always loved that bit. Is it the one at the corner? The, no. Because the there's, there's the Alley Brothers at the corner, it, it, and then there's one just opposite. See, see, see the thing is, is that it, it, it was it's 135 Sinclair Drive, and it used to be next to a dental technician. And the thing is, it's flipped from being a shop to flats. Right, so back. many times. So I don't know where it is. It, what it is now. I've not uh, been in a while. She got it because of a good bakery. Big Bear Bakery. Big Bear, that sounds hipster. The, is it oh, hipster bakery? Uh, it's hipster. Uh, oh, mate, mate, honestly, hipster bakeries. I, I'm yeah. so there. But So, obviously talking about Glasgow, can you narrow it down to your top five things about this wonderful city of ours? Well, I was thinking about this, right? Because what is it that Glasgow has given me? And it's certainly given me my, my sense of humour. Mm. So I think I'm always going to have to mention so for me, for me, so it was comedy and music, okay, are big, big things in my life. So in terms of comedy, Billy Connolly's the governor. He is the absolute governor. Yeah. I think the oh, whenever I see him trending on Twitter, my heart sinks. And then you find I out, know. no, he actually said something really funny. Yeah, because oh, he, he was at the NTAs or something, he was, or the BAFTAs, and he yeah. did like a pre-recorded interview. Yeah. And he was like, thanks very much. Cheerio. And at the end, and I remember watching and getting quite like teared up with because yeah. it's like he's not doing many appearances now and because no. he's poss i would say possibly the one person and like i would want to meet the most uh I've, well i did meet him once oh, i was gonna and, ask that well but. the thing is is that right okay so um i mean so my, my thing with billy Connolly is is that when i was uh when, when we were in bishop briggs so we're in our, in our house and i always say this is that when you grow up in an immigrant house, like in my case, an Indian household, it's full of great music and stuff, but it's stuff that, you know, so in the house you've got like Sikh devotional songs and you've got like Bollywood soundtracks and they're great. Yeah. But then you kind of want, well, where's the stones? Where's the Beatles that my pals are talking about? And, yeah. but in amongst all this stuff, for some reason, there was a Billy Connolly album and I didn't know who Billy Connolly was. Um, and I've asked my dad recently, he said, how did that album get there? He said, probably, uh, Jim from work maybe lent it to me or something and I just put it and I never listened to it so I was aware of this quite scary looking guy because <laughs> before he had his teeth done he looked pretty scary <laughs> and then the banana boots and all that yeah. he looked really rock and roll and it was Billy Connolly bites your bum and already because I was actually quite straight laced and square I thought we oh, can't say that on an album cover so then I'm aware of this Billy Connolly character and then watching Parkinson one Saturday night which is appointment television when I was a kid and there's Billy Connolly, there's that scary guy. Oh, he's from Glasgow. Oh, we better be good then, because it'll be embarrassing if he isn't. Yeah. So he's there, and Angie Dickinson, 
who at the time was the star of a show called Police Woman, which was the biggest show on the planet, possibly, at that time. So, guy from Glasgow, biggest TV star in the world, please don't make a mess yeah. of this. And he tells that, I mean, it's legendary now, but he tells that story about how he supported Elton John on tour in the States and people were throwing pipes at him and all that. <laughs> and he said, I was made, to, I was made, as, welcome, I was made as welcome as a fart in a spacesuit." <laughs> and he did that line. And Angie Dickinson actually nearly fell off her chair laughing. Yeah. She did this really slow laugh, but she nearly actually melted laughing, right? And he had to wait and kind of twiddle his thumbs while... Angie Dickinson, the star of Police Woman, yeah, was laughing. He changed the game in terms, mm. of, like, in terms of media appearances. And you watch the, it was years after it came out, but the audience with. Oh, God. See, these, now the audience with is, for my money, the best 45, 50 minutes, whatever, of comedy that exists. Because yeah, it's so interesting though, watching, at the time, the biggest celebrities in Britain completely let their guard down. Helpless. And just creasing like howling laughter and you're just that's a guy from glasgow yeah, no, it's brilliant it's a, it's a, it was a moment it was a moment yeah. like, and you're thinking especially in that routine when he's talking about growing up in the tenement yeah and you're thinking they're not going to get this they're not going to get the vertical village thing they don't get the bedlam 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 eider down all that stuff they are howling and that was a real moment for me actually yeah. because i used to write for goodness gracious me the asian sketch show right and it was the same thing it's like I find this funny and my brother finds it funny. Does that make it funny? Yeah. Well, just think of Billy Connolly. He had the brass balls to say, it made me laugh, therefore it's funny. It's going to, yeah, if and it makes you laugh then. Kevin Bridges is the same. Yeah. It clearly made him laugh, therefore it's funny. Yeah. I still suffer from that. I kind of need a two-tick system. So I do a lot of my writing with Donnie McCleary. So he writes bags, mags and bags with me. We've done yeah. 10 series of it and I'm very, very proud of it. But it's a two-tick system. Yeah. Donnie has to find it funny first for me to believe Absolutely. that it was funny no, and that. billy ha you know he just had that confidence yeah. and the thing is it informs your body language it's, a, it's the same with kevin bridges you see the way that he prowls the stage like i know this is funny yeah and i'm and he does that thing that conspiratorial look to the side like wait to hear this <laughs> and uh, i'm waiting to, to i'm waiting yeah. and Connolly's the same he just he has that swagger and that's the thing about stand-up it's i don't do stand-up for this reason because i don't think i've got the confidence to actually do proper proper i mean do i do after dinner and i can do this sort of thing and yeah. comparing but i think to actually go and tell your stories is actually a bit of a quantum leap if there is such a thing as a bit of a quantum leap um, but i you have to you have to sell it and you have yeah. and, and when you look at billy Connolly, i mean luckily what he's saying is incredibly funny yeah. anyway but the fact <laughs> that he sells it so well too and then does that thing of doing the tangent to a tangent to a tangent, but then he always comes back somehow to the middle knows. brackets. <laughs> Everyone else has forgot where he started. Yeah, no, oh, he, knows, no, no, yeah. he knows where he started. So Billy Connolly, absolutely. And I do think that we are a, 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 a city of storytellers. Yep. So in a very, very different way, Armando Iannucci, who actually went to my school. So it's that thing you were talking about. He was a few years ahead of me. So I never met him <laughs> at school, but I would see his name in the magazine. Right. So obviously it was like a fee paying school. So it was all about exam success, right? Yep. So we had got exams from primary four. And because I wasn't really good at anything else, I was always, that was my thing. I'm, I need to be top and get this yep. and that and the other. So I'd look in the, in the school magazine and there was a guy in fourth year when I was in primary six who was getting the prizes for physics and English and maths and right. this and that. And it's a guy called Amando Iannucci. So I remember thinking, I, I want to be that guy. I don't mm -hmm. even know what he looks like, but I want to be that guy. And then by the time I got to secondary school, I think he'd left. Uh, and then I'd see this Armando Iannucci name on the credits of things like the yeah. Mary Whitehouse experience. I thought... Well, there can't be that many Armando <laughs> of that, yeah. Um There might be in Naples, but I don't think there's that many here. <laughs> and if he's from, if that guy's from Glasgow, it's probably the same guy, and yeah. it was. So, I mean, he's just been the progenitor of just, about, you know, Alan Partridge. I was about to say, like, the creator oh. of Alan Partridge. Who? On the hour, Veep. Um, he and Chris Morris are my two living uh, living comedy gods, not, not in terms of stand-up, in terms of like narrative comedy, making narrative yeah. comedy. Him and Chris Morris are the guys, and they bloody work together and on the hour and, and various things. And Veep, and I was lucky enough to work with Armando. Um, he's got a show called Avenue 5, which is, I don't know, have you heard about this? It's, 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 there's a third series starting quite soon. Is it NBC? No, it's, so it's basically it's Hugh Laurie yes. plays, yes, he, so he's a captain of basically a cruise ship in space. Yes. And he's pretending to be American, but he's actually an actor pretending to be American. And um, I luckily got a part playing Hugh Laurie's husband. <laughs> I know, right? 
So the idea is in the future, everyone's in throuples, not couples. So while Hugh Laurie's in space, he's got a husband and wife at home. <laughs> and so I got, and the thing was that I wasn't physically in the room with Hugh Laurie on camera because we're in London yep. and he's, but Hugh Laurie, as big a star as he was, actually read his lines in while we did oh, our- Oh, brilliant. So I got to meet Hugh Laurie, That's who's awesome. another hero of mine. Yeah. Yeah, Brian La Hugh and Laurie is uh, Brian Laurie is um, up there with my top five TV shows of all time. So I'm getting to work with him for two days, but it was amazing. Brilliant. And Amanda was cutting about as well, and uh, and so I had he did I the have thick of Amanda. it as well, didn't he? Hmm? The, the thick of it, like Ian oh. uh, Tucker and stuff like that, because his mad dad was mad, and he was like, "You need to watch this program oh, in the thick of it." And I was like, "All right," and it was, and, and I think one of the first clips I ever saw was when. It, uh, Capaldi walks through the room and he's fucking cunt, blah blah blah. Yeah. This cunt thing, like, and I was like, like, yeah. this is okay. This is I'm in. <laughs> I tell you, because Pierre Capaldi was someone that I'd always really liked. I'd seen him in things like um, Metamorphosis, the Franz Kafka thing he did, but also he's in things like Crow Road, and he he was always a very kind of calming, avuncular presence, right? And then you see the thick of it, and he's just the sweariest man. <laughs> The most aggressive and it was I, I honestly my eyes were like dinner plates i thought yeah. oh my god i didn't know you had that in the locker but you know the story about how he got the gig no so what happened was was that that was his second audition that day he said he, he, he said he, he him and armando you'd think because they're both uh Gla, Gla, glaswegians of italian descent in the media of a certain level they probably know each other he said like we said but, but yeah you must know each other <laughs> he said, he said we, we sh probably should have met yeah. by that point but we didn't we were aware of each other obviously and that's why i was at the audition but we never actually worked together so he'd been at an audition another audition previously that day right and he said and he's, he's remarkably frank he said i was i was auditioning for this thing and it was a really small part and i was really angry because i thought surely to god i've, I've, I've earned the right to be beyond this now and, and, and I left that audition really, really fuming that I'd been sent to the audition. And I took that anger with me to the Thick Foot audition and I played it really angry. And that was why Brilliant. Malcolm Tucker was as angry as he is. And you put him together with Jamie, with Paul Higgins, who I've had the pleasure to work with and another brilliant, brilliant actor. So, oh, wow. So a Thick of It genius, yeah. utter genius. So Armando, a very different kind of storyteller. Yeah. Although, by the way, do you know who discovered Armando Nucci indirectly? It was Andy Cameron. So you know Andy Cameron, yeah, yeah. right? We're on the match. Yeah. So he discovered Amanda Nucci because, I'll tell you why, he got invited to do the Oxford lecture. Uh, what, what do they call it again? Is it just called the Oxford University lecture debate or something, right? Oh, yeah, yeah I've seen debate. It's a debate, debate thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so Andy Cameron got invited to do it. <laughs> and he said one of the other guys was this quite shy guy who was incredibly erudite and funny and like laser-guided comedy. And there's this young boy called Amanda Nucci from Glasgow. So I made sure that I got his contact details and I went back to Glasgow and I said, you should be hiring this boy. And that's how he got his first gigs on Radio Scotland. That's mad. So Armando, bless him, still says Andy Cameron is the reason where is. partially why I'm here. Very lucky to be from a city where you've got two such inspirations for comedy. And like a third, two, and a third, yeah, yeah. which is Limmy. So Limmy, Limmy I think, yeah. I think a very, very, again, very different kind of storyteller. Yeah. But comes from a very unique space. I just... um. What I love about Limmy is he's he's unashamed about being from where he is. But oh, by the way, the, the humor is incredibly surreal and dark. And it doesn't matter what accent, it, what accent it's in. Yeah, And it isn't always dark either. Sometimes he just tells beautiful stories. Oh, because I remember it was when I was at school when it was it was just exclusively like on YouTube. And it was all the, mm. the Requiem, Requiem and all that. Well, hey, is, your, is your dad there, right? Mm, hey, Requiem. <laughs> it's mum. She, she she's had her head kicked in her mum like all that like her, and finding it hilariously yeah. funny but then when i heard he was having like a show part of me was like well i don't know if that will translate yeah well to a kind of sketch show but he took it he kind of went in for a penny like don't like, don't back down double down and he went all in on the kind of surrealness of it yeah and it just really worked and so much of it is pop culture references or Glasgow references now yeah. the, he's turned away and it's against us and all that like Aye. it's so memed like it's yeah, unbelievable oh yeah. I love the plasterer oh he's so good the it's, way the way the plaster just laughs that wee bit too hard it's just oh kills me every time so good. there's such a there's such tragedy behind it but then it's interesting you talk about the move from online to telly because he clearly never needed the television no. right so he gets his telly gig 
And then he does have to obviously kind of tailor to fit to some degree. Yeah. He couldn't do everything that he was doing online. Right? Yeah. But one of my favorite things that he does is it, it, it's not dark at all, actually. It's, it, it's when, he, when, he, when he goes to the travel agent with the, with the postcard. I want to go back to Millport when I was 18. Yeah. That is just wonderful storytelling. It's there's so many wee nuggets of it. You're like, in terms of kind of what we said about Billy Connolly or Kim Bridges, story like you say storytelling, like, oh, I get that. Like mm. that's referenced to to me. Yeah. He finds it funny. Other people will find it funny. And you think of the niche stuff that Limmy you'll do that, you know, especially with Didi fucking when he does that whole Dan and Danone thing. Yeah. I speak in Lassie says Danone. But the thing in Lassie says Dan <laughs> oh, I was honestly I nearly shot a kidney laughing. Partly of the bravery of chasing down such a niche reference and such a tiny, tiny thing and having the brass balls to yeah. chase it down the hole. I thought, well played, sir, because I wouldn't have the courage to do that. I also can't see a bus that says Yoka. Yeah, you, 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 you have to say it that way. Yeah. Yoka. Yoka. <laughs> you can't help yourself, yeah. Because even his Twitch stuff, like now like he's really kind of he finds pockets of to put his kind of content out there and he really goes all in and right. his twitch stuff you just see it on youtube and everything clipped all the time i, I tell you what though you, you you're right about him going all in and it's disarmingly honest and you read his books and it's like have you got anything left for yourself yeah because you have put it all out there yeah, and i yeah, do yeah. worry I love how honest he is about mental health. I mean, I've yep. done it myself. I've talked about m m issues that I've had. So, and when I've met, see, I never know whether, whether to call him Brian or Limmy when I meet him. <laughs> because that, it, I, this actually happened. I was I, I was doing a job in Edinburgh. I was, I was at the, the, the BBC studios in, in Edinburgh. And I was just walking up Castle Street, I think it was. And I got a deep, direct message on my phone and it's Limmy saying, did you just walk past me? I'm on Castle Street. Do you want a coffee? So one level of me is saying, oh, um, oh, Brian's wanting a coffee. And one level is, Limmy wants to have a coffee. <laughs> Limmy's asked me to have a coffee with him. So uh, he's, he's a very, very approachable, nice guy and yeah. just really, really honest. So we we would have a couple, a couple of times I used to meet him in Byers Road and we would talk about what medication we're on for, for depression. <laughs> are you on the 20 megs? I'm on the 30s. I, oh, I should try them. They're good. Aye, aye. Oh, you got that Swapping, new <laughs> um, um, So I, I, I'm glad, you know, he's... But I do worry that he's maybe not left anything for himself for like, himself, in terms yeah. of, but then that's his art. I mean, I, I, I guess it sounds really pretentious, but like it, it, you really should commit. You should go mm -hmm. all in. Yeah. You 100%. know, well, yeah. And, and I think I don't, I don't and you can't not, yeah. but I don't think pre people appreciate how brave that is. Mm -hmm. Well, people talk about brave comedy. Yeah. Yeah. You're not running into burning buildings and getting Wayne's out, Yeah, but it is. You're brave. laying it bare and you're oh, yeah. putting your soul out there. And also the, way in which we consume media and the way people can comment and criticize oh everything. My God. You're putting it out there. Everyone's a critic now. Everyone. Everyone's a critic. Like I, when I told my mates, I was like, I'm going to start a podcast. A couple of them are like, are you sure? Yes. Like, are you sure? Loads of them supportive, but just a couple of them more yeah. really like, kind of like people will call it shit. People will oh, yeah. call, come for you. Yeah. And you have to have that. But I think I'm not comparing what I'm doing. To what Lemmy can no, do. No, no, but, but that's putting the thing. Yourself but, out but, there. No, but you, you are putting yourself out there. Yeah. And you're you're absolutely right. I mean I mean the, the best thing about Twitter is it's a democracy, and the worst thing about Twitter is it's a democracy. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> some people don't deserve an opinion. But we can't be God about that. Yeah. So you just have to give everyone an opinion. Exactly. And then learn how to filter out the white noise. Exactly. If they don't yeah. have a a profile picture is yep, exactly. not for me. <laughs> no, exactly. And there are certain profile pictures as well that you know, <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about, that, yes, that, that are telltale signs. Yes, yes, yes. Then you have a wee read of some of the tweets they've done and retweeted. And you just you have think, to read the bio. And your you're like, opinion oh is actually less than not valid. You know, yeah. you're a negative equity when it comes yeah. to your opinion. A lot of the worst Twitter accounts have flags in there. Uh, user bio and that's both that's no 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 you're flags right. there no no but if yeah, you have yeah, a flag no, in yeah. it yeah. there's a good chance it's a very very good chance yeah 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 so, so what that, that flag has done is it's just punctured any <laughs> any credulity that you ever had <laughs> and so moving away from people of or glaswegians mm. people of glasgow is there anything about glasgow or well, places in glasgow that you would say well i mean top five yeah because i was talking about comedy music very important to me and there's there was almost like too many bands that i could have mentioned yeah. you know actually too many dimensions i thought well what about the venue and that's yeah. the barlands what a place what a place i mean i'm 
It's not me that's saying that. It's every performer that's ever played yeah. in the Barlands. If I was to it. have a, a, a no Gallagher, Liam Gallagher on the couch, I went, what's your top five music venues? Aye. And they've played everywhere. Yeah. Guaranteed the Barlands would be yeah. there. Even Fun. Ian Brown with his karaoke act. <laughs> Saw that this morning. Oh my god! Oh hey, hope he's oh. not bringing that to the Barlands. <laughs> um, strange, strange. But it's man. such it's such a good movie. But I've seen like, I've seen wrestling yes. in it as well. Like the character it has, I know. It's, oh, it's not been done up since the seventies. Like they've kept it authentic. Though it's not just fallen up, or the, the bits of it that are falling apart. Mm. But it's just got if the walls could talk. Oh, yeah. in that place. Uh, no, it's a special. Special, special. Place. I've seen so many different kinds of bands there as well. I mean, everyone from Travis to New Order to oh, I've been on the stage, yeah, a couple of times. Once I was, um, I was doing this documentary back in 2014. My pal Helena, who was a producer, said, um, How would you fancy trying to learn Gaelic for this documentary? The idea is it's actually specifically about me trying to learn Gaelic right. to present a music show on Radio Nangale. And I kind of thought, well, I do like languages, as I've said. Yeah. That sounds like quite a nice challenge. Um, part of the thing is, is Fiona, my wife, is second generation Stornoway. And we joke that our kids should speak um, English and Gaelic and Punjabi. Yeah. But I never taught them Punjabi and she never taught them Gaelic. So <laughs> it might be quite a nice thing to have a go at. And part of that was with the Vatasi boys were playing in, in the Barland. So I, I got on the stage to introduce them. But better than that... Um, you heard of a band called Wilco, American band Wilco. No. So they're like a really, really quite kind of highly regarded. I suppose you'd call them alt country, but they're also quite rocky. Right. Anyway, they're from the States. Uh, and I did a show called Look Around You back in 2005. So for people that don't, don't know the show, it, it was a spoof of Tomorrow's World. And for people who don't know that show, <laughs> it was in the 70s and 80s and possibly 90s. Yeah. It was on before Top of the Pops on a Thursday, 7 o'clock. And the idea was it's half an hour about the future you know, what's going to happen in the future, 3D printing, da da da. what's going to happen? Like a magazine show. And um, Look Around You was a note-perfect spoof of Tomorrow's World. And I was lucky enough to get a wee part in it playing a, a character um, who liked synthesizers so much, he called himself Synthesizer Patel. And I played this guy, <laughs> Hello, Billy. And he was, he was obsessed with um, uh, security. So there's all that burglar arms and the synthesizers. And it got real cult status, you know, because his look was really strong. His sideburns, these amazing glasses, this shirt with musical notes on it and a skinny leather tie. <laughs> and uh, I love doing it. It's, just, it's actually possibly one of my, possibly my favorite job I've ever done. Because I got to work with some Mark Keep, Kevin Eldon, Peter Serafinovitz, Olivia Coleman. I'm in the scene with Olivia names. Coleman. Bad Matt news. Lucas is cutting about. <laughs> um, I'm sitting there like in the green room trying not to fangirl. Yeah. Cause, like, Everywhere I'm looking, there's a hero. So I thought, I'll do my Guardian crossword and appear intellectual. And as I'm doing it, Mark Heap he's, he puts his head in, looks me in the eye and says, eight across asymptote. And then walked away <laughs> in, that, in that Mark Heap that voice. Your... Shalom. <laughs> he, he just did Mark Heap to me. That is I was like, oh amazing. my God, I could die now. <laughs> Shaking. Yeah, well, I was. A, absolutely. He's a lovely guy, Mark Heap. Um, it turned out we had the same agent. He's just a nice oh, guy. Right, right. So... Um, uh, so I did uh, look around you, and then that was 2005. And then about four years later, Robert Popper. So Robert Popper, he's one of the writers, producers, and stars of Look Around You. But he's also the guy that wrote um, Friday Night Dinner. I mean, the guy is, and, and he's also a brilliant classical guitarist. He's a genius uh, and a really, really nice man. And, and he got in touch, and um, he said, oh, by the way, Synthesize Patel is, um, has been name-checked in this song. And he sends me the link, and it's Wilco. And it's a song called You'll Never Know. And it's quite a lot. It's a lovely kind of George Harrison-ish sounding song. And for no reason at all, they name check Synthesizer Patel. So there's this rhyming couplet. It's, it's a long, heavy hell. It's a wish down a well. I don't care anymore. I don't care anymore. It's a long, heavy hell. Synthesizer Patel. I don't care anymore. And then after Synthesizer Patel, there's this kind of synth fill so da -na 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 -na, <laughs> to underline it. And from nowhere, right? And then it's not referenced again, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, I was, I was really chuffed by this, right? Uh, and um, it, it turned out that um, what happened was is that when Wilco were touring in the UK, someone had put a pile of comedy DVDs in the tour bus and they obsessed. I think they obsessed about Dark Place, which is wonderful, uh, and Look Around You. And they, the keyboard player, Michael Jorgensen, particularly loved, loved Synthesizer Patel. Patel. 
So I'm really, really chuffed, right? And then a year later, through Robert again, MJ, Michael Jorgensen, said, uh, we're wondering if the actor that plays Synthesize Patel would like to join us on stage at the Royal Festival Hall in London for a gig. And he could, the idea is, is just uh, at that point in the song that he just wanders on and does a bit of a dance. Because I do this kind of dance at Synthesize Patel um, with this kitar, which is like a guitar yeah, and a yeah. stick. And I said, yes, um, I, tell me exactly where I need to be because that's never going to happen again. And so um, apparently what happened was that they'd, because uh, there's a funny story attached to that, so they, they know they're playing the Royal Festival Hall. So they phone ahead to a music store in London to get a guitar uh, to get sent to the Royal Festival Hall, but it gets sent to the Royal Albert Hall, right? So someone brings a guitar in, and, and the Royal <laughs> Philharmonic are there. Like, <laughs> nice. Change. This is a change. <laughs> nice. Did you order the guitar? <laughs> that wasn't me, mate. So then gets put back in the taxi and sent to the Royal Festival Hall. And so, yeah, I just wander on stage and do, do a bit of a dance and... Uh, I think 15 people in the audience got it and the rest, <laughs> the rest thought um, I was caring the community. <laughs> so anyway, after the gig, chatting, chatting away to the band, they're lovely. And Michael said, oh, just a, we, we were so glad you could make it. Which, I said, what part of London are you from? I said, I'm from the Glasgow part of London. <laughs> I said, what, did you come down for this? I said, well, yeah. I wasn't going to say no. And I said, is that a problem? He said, no, we're in the Barlands in two nights. Do you want to join us again? <laughs> so... I wander on to the Barland yeah. stage, the hallowed Barland stage, stage with Wilco, wow. and I give it a bit of a dance. And as I'm walking off, and I, to this day I don't know who said it, someone shouted out, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I have no idea why. <laughs> I have no idea why. Maybe because he knew that the the, the, the guitar wasn't actually plugged in. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was a... It that was wasn't a, authentic. It was, it was a hardcore, richer sound muso. He's a big synthesizer fan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you'll find that was discontinued. <laughs> it was dangerous. So, um, so that was that was really nice. And I've been backstage. In fact, there was a funny story. I, I went to see um, the Jesus and Mary chain. Yeah, this must have been. It was pre-COVID, so maybe four or five years ago. And I've always loved the Jesus and Mary chain. I mean, they're another brilliant, not Glasgow, but East Coast Bride, but yeah, Glasgow yeah. area band, who totally did their own thing. I mean, it was like scared. I, I was quite scared of them. You know. I never got to see them the first time around in the kind of uh, late 80s, early 90s. So they did a tour four or five years ago, and it's, it's the brothers again, J um, Jim Reed and um, uh, his brother. Was, what is his brother called? I can't remember. But I was always quite scared of Jim Reed. He had a real stage presence. And anyway, so the gig was amazing. I mean, really, really good. And we were just leaving. And then the, the door opened just to the left of the stage, and it's, it's the manager, and he spotted me. He said, oh, Mate, I'm a big fan. Do you want to come um come come for a, a wee bud? I said, yeah, I'll come for a wee bud. So me me and my pals went in, and then there, Jim Reed was there. And I'm still quite scared of him, and he's <laughs> he's having a chat with someone, and then ended up being the three of us, and uh and and I and I said um, I'm still like stay quite quite scared of him. I said, uh, <laughs> so Jim, I, I just want to say by the way, um, that, you know we've never met, but. That was amazing. I mean, I missed you the first time round, and you were every bit. You you just totally delivered. I loved it, and and uh, just thanks. And he said to me, uh, "Ah, he's got a very deliberate way of speaking." And he says, um, "Which isn't great for podcasts, I, but it is an impersonation." <laughs> he said, um, I, "I live in Cornwall now. I have done for uh, a number of years." And um, I've got a pal from East Kilbride that will come and visit me in my gaff in Cornwall. And when he's cutting about with me, we're known as the Jack and Victor of Cornwall. And until that moment, I didn't know that he knew who I was. <laughs> yeah, just some random went... Asian guy. I was <laughs> so oh, chuffed. That... <sighs> <sighs> so Barlands just that uh, has brilliant. that kind of, it's just a magnet yeah. for all the best. Aye. And like you say, anyone you talk to, I'd, in fact, I've, I've, I've contributed to, to a documentary about the Barrenlands, which is going to go out, I think, on the Scottish Channel. I don't know when. Um, the last time I went there was for the the Barload of Soul, a big Northern Soul all dayer thing. So basically, you go there, and it's all these six year old guys in stay press trousers and Pringle dancing their socks off. It's amazing because <laughs> it was obviously Barland Ballroom. It's yeah, a sprung yeah. dance floor, which is part of the the Why? charm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've been to see Primal Scream there. Um, I wish I'd seen Bowie there, but I never did because I know he's got that black star, hasn't he? Yeah. In the in the ceiling, 
Um, I've been to see got Pete and Diesel. You know, I've been. It's just been uh, uh, soul to soul. Great gig. They 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 played like the sort of like a kind of heritage kind of um, uh, uh, tour, and we I went to see them there. Because they've uh, got the bit at the uh, bottom of the Gallagate now with the all the bands and the wood and yes. the floor, and like, and if you walk along and just see some of the bands and the dates they played, yeah, and it's like that's mad. Like yeah. they weren't even that big at that year, but then you walk maybe another hundred yards up. And there they are again. There they are again. At their peak, at their when peak. they've come back. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and they all brilliant. want to play it. They don't, yeah. you know, they'd all rather play it. It's, it's, it's the best. It's the, for me, it's the best venue in the world. Yeah, fantastic. Is there one place now in Glasgow you would say is your favourite? It, it still makes me slightly gasp when I see it, and it's the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. Yeah. It's the scale of it. It's enormous, and it's beautiful. And everywhere you look, it's just a work of art. And I'm not even talking about the content of it. I'm just talking about yeah, the building. Yeah, that's your building. You know, and it's the story of the, was it the wrong way around? Well, they say uh, that, yeah, it's the wrong way around. But it. actually, it's also inside out. You can see plug points and Artex. No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, that is the, the proper story that he killed himself because yeah, he, built, he built, it built it the wrong way around. Back to I front. remember being a wee guy in here in that story. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he took it as I, absolute Bible. I've been, like. told it's, I've been told it's utter mint. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> it's, it's the same as the, uh, the, um, the what do you call it, the... What was what was that apocryphal story that was doing the rounds? Oh yeah, that um, the sax break in um, uh, Jerry Rafferty was played by Bob Holness. Now, do you know where that story comes from? No. It was Stuart McConey said it as a joke, and it just and it grew arms and legs. <laughs> also, remember Marilyn Manson was the was the, was His the ribs removed? No, no, the <laughs> other one. The Marilyn Manson was was from Paul, the Wonder Years. Paul from the Wonder, Paul Years. Wonder Years. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah it was cool. no, it's just the other Marlon one was he got his ribs removed so he could. I believe that now yeah. because he's <laughs> obviously dodge hiding in plain sight. It's, yeah. you know, it's like Jimmy Savile. Yeah. Did you not? Did you honestly not see that? Yeah, it's just so weird. Yeah. And people are like, no, I can't be that. You can't weird. be that weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. I heard a story in a different way that Paul McCartney, not but in a different way. Apparently, Paul McCartney, right? He's got a gaff in Brighton. He says whenever he goes to London, he just gets the train, right? And people say, Kai looks at Paul McCartney, but it, can't, it can't would be never Paul be McCartney. Paul McCartney. And he gets away with it. He totally That's gets brilliant. away with it. So yeah, the Kelvin Grove. And whenever I drive that sweep just up Argyle Street, and I do, I do it. It's a glorious sight. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, whenever people come to Glasgow, I love seeing that there's always tourists there to see it. It's the scale of it. It's like when you go to Rome or Delhi, and you've got these massive edifices that actually make you feel like quite insignificant because of the sheer scale of it. I mean, I have this fantasy actually that. It's actually like a transformer, and that if aliens do come it to Glasgow, change. it'll stand up, <laughs> and it will like it will casually with a swipe of a spire just take a spaceship out of the sky like that, and then sit its ass back down. But also, as being a, a tight dad, like you say, it's free. It's free. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then the, when the good stuff comes, you have to pay for it. Uh, but no, it is. It's free. So when I was growing up, like my dad, like taking his like out of the weekend or whatever, and it would be the museum. Uh, Art museum or the transport uh -huh. museum and they were they were brilliant they, they were, were great brilliant. and yeah. they were so so good and i think yeah. it really captures glasgow and beyond which is pretty impressive to do yeah it's, a, it's, yeah. A, it's an amazing amazing place now we could obviously sit in here and talked for still game at the whole time but i didn't want to do that but before we get there um you said that your dad had a shop you've got your radio place yeah. in a shop yeah you probably spent a lot of time when your dad was working there. Yeah, yeah. It was my mum, actually. Oh, was it your mum? It was my mum. My, my, yeah, my mum my mum put the hours in. Yeah, yeah, Grafter, yeah. grafter. Mm. But would you be able to cut it down to your top five confectionery snack items? Very, very difficult because so it changes it on the daily, but we'll try and rattle through this. In as much, okay, in as much it does change on a daily, I, I tried to go for ones that I thought were like, like kind of like longevity and things I'll go back to, you yeah. never go away from them. And number one is topics. Okay. Lo I love a topic. I think they're exactly the right size. I think they're exactly the right chocolate to nougat ratio. And I love a hazelnut or three. Um, it's a it's a lovely, uh, I don't know how many, cause you know now what, how many calories on a chocolate bar. I'd imagine it's probably all right. Maybe on the right side of 150 calories. I, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating <laughs> wildly. But what's annoying me about topics is you can't get them everywhere anymore. Uh, and I, I actually mentioned this. I was doing a Q&A thing. And I mentioned topics, and none of the millennials knew what I was talking about. I see you tell me you don't know what a topic is. Is there a generation that doesn't know what a topic is? That, I that, that not. I, I was trying to. I was in the shop the uh, the other day actually, and I was looking for some chocolate, and I didn't see a topic. And 
I don't know what's I'm happened. I'm a fan of a topic myself, but it's not not what I've. I've uh, it makes seen. me wonder whether topics have, have said something racist once and they've been cancelled. <laughs> Kinder Buenos swooped in there. Yeah, you know what I mean? Kinder Buenos, yeah, you can't can't move for them, can you? Oh, aye. It does remind me very briefly of a story that Mark Cox told me. So Mark, who plays Tam, is still game, right? So he said he was really a hungover when he was like early 20s, really hungover. And the only thing that that was going to do it was an iron brew and a curly whirly, right? Curly whirly. (laughs) So he goes into the shop run by uh, an Asian dude. And uh, so he gets the curly whirly, sorry, he gets the iron (laughs) brew out of the fridge and he puts it on his head like, and then, he goes to the chocolate stanchion and they're all there, Kit Kat, Yorkie, Turkish Delight, Bounty. There's no Curly Whirly. He, he scans it three times, no Curly Whirly. So he goes up and he's like, oh, mate, have you not got any Curly Whirly? He says, I don't stock Curly Whirly. It's too long for a shelf. <laughs> 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 you'd think you'd make space, wouldn't yeah. you? Uh, so so topic number one, yeah. um, a close second. Um, the, the, the other two chocolates are really like a picnics and mint arrows. The picnic feels like a meal, you know, like a full meal, like the, all your food groups sort of thing. Yeah. You, go, I, I do like that sweet spot of the, the fruit, the nut, the chocolate. And I'm not, I'm not a fan of fruit see, and chocolate. See, I'm not, well, I'm not, but my, I'm, my wife's I, the same. Yeah. We, 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 what we'll do is we'll buy fat. If we're in the cinema, right, or on a car, and we get the the bag of Revels. Yeah. yeah. I get, I get, I get the, the fruit ones rammed in my <laughs> mouth because like, she knows I'll eat anything sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I know a few, a few you, a yeah. few you, but I, I, and I. I I'm not the biggest fan of a fruit and nut, but I do like a picnic because I think there's, uh, the, the ratios a nice are balance. a bit different. There's, a nice there's, more, there's biscuit in it, which maybe yeah. tempers. But you, know? you say I, I love a mint arrow because I am not an orange chocolate fan either. I'm yeah. in the minority there, I feel. But like, uh, I hope that's not a sectarian thing. You've gone, <laughs> you've gone that's for exactly the why. Is that exactly why? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> but a mint arrow, I do. And I've, I think they've changed something with the mint arrow. They certainly changed the shape of the... It used to be just like your kind of standard bars in a row. And now it's kind of more of a bubble thing, but there seems to be a change in the taste as well, which I don't approve of. Again, I'm a big thing. I'm a big believer in you got to keep the ratios the same. You know, like when they miniaturize chocolates for your celebrations, yeah. or and they don't always get it right. Like for me, yeah, the mini Twixes feel like Twixes, but yeah. the mini Maltesers don't feel like Maltesers. They just feel like something else. Yeah. So call it something no, else. No, that makes sense. All you're doing is piggybacking on the brand, then, aren't you? <laughs> I've thought about this too hard. Haven't yeah, I? Um, I really respect that. Because... But, but yeah, Mint Aero, I love. I love how it dissolves. See, you get a mint arrow, and you don't even need it to your coffee because you can actually get, look, you let your own saliva do the work. It feels when you have it, you're like, well, that wasn't a chocolate bar. That was quite yeah. light. Like, you feel, you I, I don't wonder, feel guilty again, about mostly having it. air. <laughs> Same as the curly whirly. I mean, it's a lattice chocolate. So how much is, it's probably like, I don't know, uh, a Kinder Egg in terms of the, the volume of chocolate. So those are my three chocolates. Um, crisps I love. I, I mean, I absolutely adore crisps. Um, and... I mean, I do like things like your um, uh, the more elaborate ones, like the higher end crisps, the dinner party crisps, yeah, yeah. like the the Walkers, the lime uh, poppadoms. Yeah, they're amazing. But the thing is, they're, they're they're hardly there. They're ephemeral. They're gone. Um, so um, I, I've gone for a more sturdy, I'd say, adult crisp, which is the uh, the ridged crisp, which is the Walkers, the this the, the sorry, no, the um, the steak bait McCoy, McCoy steak, flame grouse steak McCoy's yeah. the goat. Of crisps for me. Well, I, are, you, are you with me then? Oh, are you, are you, oh, good, oh good. Um, just because when I worked in Barry's, I used to run. They had a, a, a Twitter account, and I used to run like polls, and we did the World Cup of crisps. So, and I had it group stages. Did you? It was polls, and it got in. And Flame Girl Steak McCoy's. Who came was in out, the final? Uh, Flame Girl Steak McCoy's versus Thai Sweet Chili Sensations. Fair enough. Yeah. Thai Sweet Chili Sensations, I like, but I find if I have too many, that I get the ulcers. <laughs> To be fair, as well with the with with your um, McCoys, the ridging can cause a Toblerone oh, of the mouth yeah. and a little bit of the, the roof of the mouth. Yeah, but I it's a worth is a price worth paying. I Absolutely. think. Absolutely. And also, I suffer terribly from heartburn, and I know it's in the post. Again, you know. Yeah. Me I mean, maybe maybe what they need to do is just sell it at Rennie's straight onto the crisps. <laughs> as it on the. I mean, I'd I'd love Pizza Express to to market pizza pizza <laughs> antacida, <laughs> crumbled Rennie's with the goat's cheese. Because yeah, me and Ray talked about on the first episode talked about uh, I get really bad heartburn and when I go out now it is keys wallet phone Rennie's. I yeah. cannot leave the house. No, no, I, I actually we talked about cruises before. Yeah. Um, the problem with cruises is you eat all the time because you can. And you say to yourself, of course I'm not going to eat pizza at four in the morning. And then you're eating pizza at four in the morning. And I remember watching, it was must have been 2014, because I was watching the World Cup on yeah. this massive screen by the pool. And I had the worst heartburn I've had in my life. 
and there was no there was no antacid on the ship. There was half <laughs> half a rennie that the the, the the doctor had, and that's all I had. I was doubled up with the pain oh, no. of, of yeah. So lesson learned. So yes, um, Walker. Uh, I keep saying Walkers. It's not Walkers. No. It's, it's the Chili McCoys or the steak the steak McCoys. Yep. Have I left one slot then? One slot. Ooh. It was in the it was in the biscuit region, I believe. Okay, the biscuit region. Right. Okay. Uh I've gone mint and chocolate and haven't I? Mint Vika. Yes. Again for me, the goat. Yes. I th- they were the biscuit in my house. They were yeah. prime, prime. Were they like a Saturday biscuit? Could you was it sort of like to save them for No, it was like if you didn't eat them quick, they were gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um I, I I love um a cream mint cream. I just it's just to me it's yeah I, I, with the cho- oh just and then <laughs> with that green foil it, it feels like your minor royalty yeah and you, you feel, feel like a princess Louis Anne. triangle when you finished it oh, oh good oh. times good. I think maybe there's something about because I really love the green triangles in the quality street maybe there's something but that's not mint though that's just no no it's just there's something about that I think foil the big purple ones might be my favourite in quality, in quality street. street I'm a, I'm the strawberry. I mean, I don't like I strawberry. Said, yeah, the strawberry creams and the roses. You should be cancelled for saying that. Are you serious? Yeah, hundred percent. No, hundred percent. This is the rebels' argument. It's amazing how some people's that orange cream is anathema to them. But we did the whole fags, mags, and bags storyline where we compared racism to rebels, <laughs> where we said, "Now, I personally, I find orange creams repulsive, but I'm not going to remove them from all the bags because that is my choice, not your choice." Um, so. Um, they, they've still got Maltesers and Rebels, haven't they? But they took the nut. I like. I do like chocolate nuts. I do. Yeah. I, sometimes I'll do that at the, at the cinema. I'll get the chocolate nuts, and after about twenty of them, you, you start <laughs> to feel a bit sick. But you keep you, you push you through, don't you? Just keep going. You just push keep through. Going. You start uh, slowing down. You start eating the chocolate off the nut. Yeah. Then you have the nut. Then you you have don't the nut. just. There's, there's, there's a wonderful Calvinist satisfaction to be had from sucking the chocolate off and then enjoying the nut. Because you think to yourself. The whole point of them doing that was so you could enjoy, enjoy it together. So, so why have you deconstructed? It's like anything eating yeah. the chocolate off us. It's like having a wagon wheel yeah. and yeah. splitting it, pulling the marshmallow out and yeah. eating it. Because people that wasn't do, designed to eat People would do that with Milky Ways, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would, eat around uh, it. Because I think they just wanted. Do you remember Etch a Sketch? Yeah. Do you remember you do that thing? If you you, you just like just could see the innards of it, you would actually yeah. just keep going, black it out. <laughs> I suppose that's the same. I want to see what the the kind of asbestos inside the Milky Way actually looks like. <laughs> I want to see the mechanics of <laughs> the how mechanics, they put yeah. this chocolate yeah. bar together. <laughs> yeah. So like I say, I mean, those, those snacks would change. But if, if I were go, or, or, if I were going into petrol station and I wanted something to tide me over, they would. They would. They, they're the ones. And, and I don't see topics anymore. So sometimes I'll go for the kind of the so-called healthier nutty snacks. And there's one, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like sea salt and caramel and dark chocolate. And I can't even mind what it's called, but that's nice that's as well. That's a shabby choice. Yeah. Now, Obviously, I couldn't have you on as a guest without speaking about Still Game. Now, this will be very hard uh, for you to do, but it's to try and narrow down and give me a top five moments from Still Game. Now, like I say, we could probably do a full episode on on that, but I wanted to get to know get to know you. But having you here, yeah, I need those. Well, fair five. play, fair play. Um, so yeah, your top five moments from from Still Game. Well. I mean, obviously, w- when I do a scene, it has an extra resonance for me because I mean, I'm Absolutely. as big I'm as big a fan as anyone, so I can be objective about the show. But with my bits, is that extra bit of yeah. memory or whatever. So, or even from filming it, where oh no, totally, how many takes it took to get through and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. So I loved filming the midlife crisis episode. So it was the hard nuts was the main storyline, but equally, Naveed has this midlife crisis, and there's the bit where Naveed goes into the bookies. And Tam's there. Yeah. Naveed, what are you doing here, Naveed? Meet the game on money. The thing is, is that, see, see, see when I go up and I pick up the pen and say, oh, look at the door TV pen. <laughs> now, I had never been in the bookies before, not properly. So that was my first time in the bookies, fictional or not. So I was asking, why is that pen so wee? <laughs> is it jockeys that come in to gamble? <laughs> is this Ikea? Why is the pen so wee? So... Part of that was me, Sanji, saying, oh, look at the door TV pens, and Naveed saying it as well. And that's just that whole bit where... Um, you get more and more into more, more the race. And then, Run faster, oh, horse. Because again, I have, I have zero interest in horse racing. Yeah. It used to, I used to take it personally. When, and you, you're probably old enough to remember this, when you're in the house on the Saturday and there's nothing to do. And there's racing on seven channels. Yeah. 
And there were only three channels. How did that happen? So no, <laughs> why is there racing on every channel? Why am I seeing Kempton Park from three angles? Why can't you put Bugs Bunny on? Why yeah. do I have to watch this? Wait, Channel Four is a great uh, yeah. channel. Yeah, it just yeah. half its afternoon was taken up by horse racing. Yeah. So annoying. So that annoyed me. And so I, I still have no interest in horse <laughs> racing. I've been to a couple of like yeah, things, I like going and, with my mates get suited and booted, uh, but like it's Grand still, National. But it's it's not something up. But there's see reading all the. Oh, the soft to mid ground. Oh, no, it's no, no, because they were saying, Oh, do, do you want to come down to the paddock and see them walking around? I did. I said, Yeah, and <laughs> and they said, Oh, by the way, our seats are by the by, by the finishing post. I couldn't give a rusty fuck. Has my horse won? No, yeah. okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. End of, and if I, you got I, a 50 pound 50 to one like you did in that, then possibly, <laughs> possibly, but I'd no, I don't. I mean, I love my football, my tennis, I can't get. I, Formula One's another one. It just leaves me absolutely cold. It's not for me. Not for me. It just honestly. In the recent, um, well, the last couple of years, I would say it's boomed in terms of people. Or, or I would say the like people have teams like football. Like, aye. oh, I'm a Ferrari fan. I'm a Alfa Romeo fan. I'm, I'm like, what? Like yeah. that just kind of blows my mind a bit. But it's again, yeah. Who am I? I like you, wrestling. So who am I no, to no, judge? I, no, <laughs> I, I appreciate the theatre wrestling. And, and when I was a kid, I mean, my dad took us to. The Kelvin Hall and it was Big Daddy and Johnny yeah, Stacks and Mick McManus and Rollball Rocco and I did love all that stuff. And Asians loved wrestling. I think it was a campery of it. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, what, were so we, what were we talking midlife, about Midlife crisis. So midlife crisis. Yeah. So the yeah. gambling uh, bit, the bit in the... Love the, that. The, love yeah. that. Um, I loved... See, whenever I watched myself doing stuff back, it, it's to try and learn. Because very few actors are like, yeah, nailed that. You know Yeah, I mean? of course. But occasionally it will happen. You no. think, yeah, nailed that. It was when um, David's uh, van gets raided by the kids and we're doing the bit after the credits where me and Tam are walking the up. up is... And then the, the and then the headmaster says, uh, sorry about that, Mr. Reed. And I say, don't, kids will be kids. And then they do that turn. You dirty bastard. <laughs> and honestly, I watched that back. I thought, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the thing, the thing is, I think I do have comedy timing because I really like music. And it's all, it is it's music. It's, yeah, yeah. It is, it's, it's exactly 100%. it. You, you have to know how many beats to wait. And I got it right. I did. Yeah. And I think, do you know what? Yes. Love that. Fantastic. So there's that. Because you were charging them, is it not? You were going like yeah. one pound there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I good. don't even have to ask you what you ate. <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that was a lot of fun. And also just like doing that scene, the kids trying not to corpse. I was going to say, having you that call yeah. like must yeah. be for them. Like... I'm brilliant at not corpsing. I think that's why I'm so good at playing David. Because it, cause he's so he's so deadpan. Yeah. I, could, I, could, I, I say that to my kids, make me laugh. You, you know, inside I'm wetting myself I but mean, facially yeah. i can totally contain it <laughs> so um there's that um winston kicking his leg out the window i, I didn't honestly it. when i first saw it didn't see it coming because we we film our bits and to be fair we do do this thing called the table read where we will all we all get around the table and we read the yep. script start to finish so i do know it, it's to some extent that's coming but then it's a full three months later before you see it yeah. actually happening so uh brilliant and what i love is the way that the paul's reaction because rather than so shouting good. ball, he just kind of just a shake of the head like, mm, don't do it. And it was it was pity. It was pitiful. Uh, so I thought it was, that made me laugh as so well. Good. It's just that slow. Yeah. Yeah. To the window. Like, oh, it's yeah. so good. So, so good. Yeah. And then with, when Jack and Victor, the Hooch episode, when, um, so it's a scene that I'm in, but I'm not in. So it's in the shop. Yeah. I've said, I think I've, I've said a bit and I've gone to the back shop. And then Isa's giving them the hoot, the wabba wabba. Um, and then and they, they try it. So I'm watching this scene from behind the beads. Brilliant. And I, but I'm not in it, but I can yeah, see. Yeah. And Ford, <laughs> he does this thing. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he does it twice. And then Greg does one of the best pratfalls where like he's having a stroke and he grabs his arm <laughs> he and, he, and he flicks the flumps up. <laughs> so he doesn't like it. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, that was the one time I did nearly lose my shit. And I right. thought, well, I can't because... I'm not even in the scene that yeah. I could ruin it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so whenever I see that back, I, I think uh, I, re, I rewound that. Like it's of... up there. See, thing, thing about still game is, and again, I can be objective about this, especially about the other guys' performances, is there's levels, like, in terms of physical comedy, that's up there with anything, with Harold 100%. Lloyd, with, with what, um, Lauren Hardy. Um, just, just lovely. And then 
And also the idea to we'll talk, talk about the bookies when, you know, when um, uh, Winston's in and, and uh, he's, he's shouting and bawling and Stevie puts the pens. That's in the, I mean, that's such hilarious. a beautiful idea. Yeah, so yeah. well executed because it's then about going on. He's really going and it's building and it's building and Stevie's just yep. slowly doing it. But that whole episode for me, probably yeah. up there in one of my top fives, I said, Stevie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve, so, so people. I mean, yeah, we, we've done a few Q and A's, and like Paul's been there, and Matt, who plays, yeah. um, Stevie's been there, and people they just love that Stevie thing. That we it, that because yeah. yeah. it was it was their relationship. You only got maybe once a series, Aye. a couple of times. So, and when you got it, it was a real, that was a, it was a real like, yeah. treat. Like yeah, a lot yeah, of people, yeah. you got to see their relationships build over the years yeah. in terms of like. Uh, like Naveed and Isa's relationship yeah. and the way that I, I, I guess you could you could compare it to you know in Seinfeld a Newman it's like his actual nemesis yeah that's the only nemesis that was anyone really ever had yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well I suppose Naveed had his nemesis the Chatterjee Jat- Jat- in one episode and but in and the the you know when Mina goes to India and yes. the, yeah but no that's the only kind of nemesis that overarches the whole kind of story yeah arc and of course the nemesis that you know Changes his identity. <laughs> you know, it. yeah. it's so it's so so good. Um, so we've got Jack and Victor the hooch. We've got the leg through the window. Uh-huh. Uh, smelling, uh, yes. smelling the kids' breath. The the the, the, bookies, the bookies midlife crisis and, and the pens. And the, pins, the whole, yeah. pens going there, guys. And but I feel bad because uh, you could we, we, we could I because, could because I'm not I'm not mentioning any of any of Bobby or Isa or. Oh, um, those you know, Bobby or, scenes yeah. where it's like you're flubber dub and nubber. Like all yeah. those wee things. Like there's YouTube clips and TikToks that are just dedicated mm. to that. And they're put into references now of everyday life. If something's like yeah. announced, like I don't say the Tories announced something that was actually good, you would <laughs> use the clip of, and, well, that's actually quite good. That yeah, when they yeah. were talking about yeah. the interest rate and stuff. Yeah. It's it's timeless almost yeah. like it really is it's because i think we still game you watch it back and i i was at school and still game on and it was just so quotable and iconic for, for me if kids get something then you take that to the bank they're yeah. not gonna lie to you and kids totally got it t- you know um that's really really gratifying because yeah. i know how obsessive i was about comedy when i was a kid Things like the young ones. I mean, yeah. I would just we would tape it and watch it over and over and over. We didn't have Netflix. You didn't have DVDs. Well, that's what but, me and my mates are still game now. Like, yeah, we just you watch it and you start episode done again and you've got it on Netflix and it's just. And then people now what they'll do is they'll just put it on if they're not feeling well or it's lasting a, it's at a night. It's a great comfort program. Yeah, like, no, that's exactly um, what it is. It's a pair of slippers. The American Office is another one that I would just kind of watch. But I'd say like, still game is just one of those. You put it on and it doesn't matter where you you can just fire on. Yeah. any episode at any point and mm. it is just fantastic and being a part of that i'm sure no no i mean it's just... I, 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 it's, it, it's so i think one day i probably will when i've got distance from it i'll appreciate how big it was yeah because it, it's hard to you know what i try to do is i try to say right think to yourself what was the thing that you lost a shit over probably the young ones or all the thick of it you know like mm-hmm. it, it to, to have that sort of impact in people's lives. I mean, I, I, I did a thing, um, we were filming in a restaurant, I can't remember what it was, and it was like um, during the day, so the restaurant wasn't open, they'd opened it for us. So they had a joiner there that was fixing the tables and he kept looking over at me, flicking up, flicking down. And I knew he wanted to speak to me. So I went over to him and said, how you doing mate? What's happening? Um, I said, uh, I said, do, do, you want, do you want a selfie? Would that be all right? I said, yeah, of course. And he was physically shaking, he was trembling. I said, mate, are you all right? He says, you don't understand. Um, I grew up in care and still game got me through. Wow. Got me through my childhood. And I get that because yeah. I've not been in care, but I remember I had a really, I, I get dumped spectacularly once and, and friends got me through it. Yeah. You know, I get, I do get how, what, what humor can do and what that kind of comfort can do. So I try to hold, I, you know, I, I try to appreciate that, you know, I think you, you were lucky enough to be a part of something that could have that effect on people. And and I never underappreciate it. I certainly never take it for granted. So when people say, "Are oh, you sick of talking about still game?" No. Why would I be? Why would you be sick of that? Yeah. You know, when people say, "Are oh, you sick of doing selfies?" Well, no. Apart from anything else, if I was a footballer in this town, I played for one half of the old firm. <laughs> half the town would want me in a throne. Half the town would want me in the ground. Yeah. I, I'm lucky enough to be in a show that's almost universally loved. So Absolutely. I'm never ever. I mean, I've, I've jokingly said this. 
that I'll, I'll be buried as David, you know, in the full costume. <laughs> and that will probably happen now because I've not actually made a will. So <laughs> we'll be digging out. What, what, we, what did there's he a say podcast here. <laughs> there's a podcast here and he said I. Um, so, uh, no, no, I, I, no, I mean, it's, I, I, like I say, I, I, I find it, I, I just always try to keep it in perspective and say, do you know what, you, you were lucky to be part of that. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we've covered quite a lot at top of there. We've covered five. So now this is the the hard part where you yes. have to pick one from each. So I'll go through each category mm. and I want you to give me your number one to create your ultimate top five. So okay. we'll start with Still Game because right. we're just talking about it. Okay. Number one moment from Still Game. Uh, Naveed and the Bookies. Subject at school. Ah, that's going to be, yeah, it's going to be maths. Place you visited? Lawrence. So, yes. Snack? Oh, do I go sweet or savoury? I think I'm going to, uh, my, 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 my old pal, The Topic. Trusty, trusty topic. Trusty topic that doesn't exist anymore. And finally, your favourite uh, thing about this wonderful city of ours, Glasgow. Billy Connolly. Perfect. <laughs> so there I am, I'm in, I'm in Florence having a wee coffee and a topic with Billy. And we've got the iPad out and watching me in the bookies and B Billy has no baldy clue who I am. And you're working out the fine. bill to get I'm some working, maths I, in. But that's arithmetic, <laughs> it's not maths. I'm showing him a parabola that I've drawn on the back of the bill. <laughs> and he's very impressed, I can tell you. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on. It's oh, been thank you. wonderful it. chatting. It's been good fun. Thank you, everyone, uh, for watching. If you could like, follow, subscribe, we'll have more content coming for you soon. Thank you.